chills. Number five. So over the last seven months, I've been working for someone I responded to on Craigslist. Well, I'll just explain everything. This seems like an appropriate place to post this. I was scouring the internet for some sort of paying gig. I didn't really care what. Then I came across a post on Craigslist. I had refreshed the page and there it was. Someone was looking for a person to come by and feed their pets. I assumed they were going out of town or something. So I contacted them and left my number through email. I got a response immediately in the form of a phone call. The caller was a man who explained to me that he was moving out of town and his parents had cats they wanted fed daily. I gave the man my name so he could run me through a cursory background check and in about 20 minutes I was hired. I went there the next morning to get all the instructions and whatnot and met the man I spoken to on the phone. His name was Ben. Ben explained to me that he could no longer be able to care for his parents' cats and that his parents needed to focus on themselves so I was being brought in to take care of that. The money would be left on the kitchen table at the end of every week, $200 a week, just to feed some cats, I know, right? In addition to that, money for more cat food would be left for me as needed. Then he told me the first thing that I thought was strange. I was to come at exactly 10 a.m. every day and be gone by 10, 10 a.m. And I was never under any circumstances to interact with his parents. He told me that when I'm in their home, they will be in their chairs in the living room watching television and that I was not to disturb them, ever. He asked if any of that would be a problem, to which I assured him it wouldn't. He then showed me the area in which the cats eat. There were four cats and where the food was kept. While not rude in the least, he was very adamant that I not explore further in the house, to which I assured him it wouldn't be a problem. He ushered me outside and showed me where the spare key was in case the door was ever locked but he told me that was very unlikely to happen. And with that, he expressed his hope that I could be trusted one last time, shook my hand, and told me to be there at 10 a.m. every day starting tomorrow. If I was ever unable to make it, call and leave a message on their home phone, to which he gave me the number. I shook my head and was on my way. The next day came and I went inside at exactly 10 a.m. I walked into the house and immediately to my right were Ben's parents, sitting in recliners, facing away from me, watching some kind of game show. I announced my presence, which they ignored, and made my way to the kitchen. I fed the cats bowls and left. The exact same scenario played out countless times over the next few months. 10 a.m., unreturned hello, feed the cats, leave. On Fridays, I would pick up the small stack of $20 bills from the kitchen table. It was the easiest job I ever had. Then came the inevitable. One day, I was running late. I got to the house at 10.08. I entered and apologized to Ben's parents for being late, to which I once again got no response. They just kept sitting in their chairs watching their game show. I went to the kitchen and fed the cats. I looked at my phone which read 10:11, and walked down the hall towards the front door. When I reached the living room, I jumped and gasped out of shock. Ben's parents were now standing in the dark behind their chairs, completely still, staring directly at me. I apologized for running late and got out of there. Though unnerved, I went back the next day on time and everything was fine. A few more months went by of nothing strange and then came the last day I was there. I got there at 10.03 but wasn't worried because I knew I could be out before 10.10. The problem came when I was in the kitchen and I heard someone whisper the words, Help me. It startled me and I jumped, looking around for the source of the cry for help. I saw no one around but I heard it again and then a third time. I began looking around before realizing I was running behind. I looked at my phone and it was 10.10. My heart sank to my stomach when I looked down the hallway and saw Ben's parents for the first time in the light. They were grossly emaciated and pale, looking completely malnourished. They were essentially walking skeletons. I apologized for taking so long and said I'd be on my way, but they just stood there, blocking the way to the front door. I said I would take the back door, which was located in the kitchen, but when I went to open it, it required a key to open from the inside, seriously. It was at this point that true panic set in. I looked behind me and the parents were now about half a foot away from the entrance to the kitchen and I had nowhere else to go except for what I presumed was a door to the pantry. They had blank stares across their faces and their eyes looked as if the life had left them a long time ago. In a last ditch effort, I went to the door that I thought was the pantry and found it led to a staircase leading into a basement with, of course, no light. As soon as I opened the door, there was a horrid stench that washed over the otherwise clean air I was standing in. I carefully went down the stairs and looked for a window, but they were all nailed shut. I happened to look back up the stairs 
and the parents were now standing next to each other at the top of the hallway. It was truly horrifying. I pulled out my phone and called 911, not knowing what else to do. And when I explained my situation, they said they would send a car out immediately and to stay on the phone while they connected me to the unit en route. I ran into the dark basement using my phone as a light. It didn't provide too much illumination since I was in the middle of a call, but it was just enough. There were racks of junk that lined the basement, separating it into almost aisles. I went down to check if any of the windows were possibly loose, like I'd be that lucky. Then I turned the light around and shined the light in front of me, and I was inches away from the parents' lifeless looking faces. I let out a scream and ran in the other direction and tripped over something, sending my phone flying from my head. Of course, it landed face down so I couldn't find it. I ran back up the stairs and into the kitchen, looking back and seeing the parents standing at the bottom of the stairs with slight grins on their faces. I ran down the hall to the front door and flung it open, screaming when I saw the cop standing right in front of me. He asked me if I was the one that called as I pushed past him to get outside, and I told him I was. I looked in the window and saw the parents sitting in their chairs, watching their game show. I explained that these crazy old people had trapped me in their house and were chasing me around. The cop went in to talk to the parents and look around while I sat in the cop car. He came back out about five minutes later and asked if I was sure someone was chasing me. I said yes, I was absolutely sure that it was the two old people that live there. He informed me that the people that live there, the people in the chairs, have been dead for quite some time. I asked what the smell in the basement was and he said there was another body down there. Backup showed up. I gave them my statement and explained how I'd been coming there every day for months and months to feed the cats. I told them to call Ben, the homeowner's son. I gave them the number and it was disconnected. I found out a few days later that the body in the basement was Ben. What I don't get is, who's been paying me? My wife and I have had the same mattress since we have been married. It is lumpy, dips horribly in the middle, and isn't large enough now that our daughter sleeps on it with us. I know, it's dangerous and not recommend it at all. But when you go six months straight with no more than an hour of sleep at a time, you eventually cave in. With that being said, I am always on the lookout for a good deal on a king-size mattress, and yesterday I found one. $125 for a new set, and not a cheap one either. Incredible, right? I thought so too, so I called the guy up and asked if it was still available. You know how sometimes they advertise something really cheap because it doesn't exist. To my surprise, it was. So I set up for my wife and daughter to go and take a look at it at 5pm. I would have rather have just gone myself, rather than dragging my cranky daughter all the way into downtown. But my wife is pretty particular on the firmness of the mattress, so I had to make sure it was comfortable for her. Brian, the guy selling the mattress, said to call when we were on our way so he would know when to meet us at the storage site. I called, but it went to voicemail, so I left one and also texted him to let him know that we were on our way. The whole drive there, my wife and I were chatting happily about how great it would be to finally have a new mattress and have our own space in the bed once again. My daughter likes to sleep diagonally, so her hands are touching mommy's shoulders and her feet are touching daddy's leg. It is very sweet and cute but also incredibly uncomfortable because I have to sleep on the knife's edge of the bed in order to not crush anyone. Dads out there, I'm sure you can relate. Fortunately, the traffic isn't too bad yet, so we make it right on time. I hate being late to appointments. It is just so unprofessional and inconsiderate, you know? I get out of the car and unstrap my daughter so that we can enjoy a cool breeze and point to all the new things she sees while we wait for Brian to arrive. After about 15 minutes, I walk into the office of the storage facility and ask to see if Brian maybe works there or if the receptionist knows anything about him. She told me that he works for a home staging company for when people try to sell their homes. That is why we can buy the mattress so cheap. It is unpackaged and set up so they can't resell it in the store. She assured me that he was a great guy and probably just running late due to traffic. I was glad I talked to her because I was still having a few doubts about why the mattress was such a good deal, but his line of work made a lot of sense. My daughter and I walked around some more, singing songs and feeling the brick wall of the building and the nylon threads of the American flag swaying in the breeze. She is a very happy, sweet girl and loves to feel new things, so I didn't notice how much time had passed until my wife popped out of the car and asked what was going on. Forty minutes had passed, 
This guy was ridiculously late. I handed off my daughter so that I could call him and see what the deal was. This is Brian. Yeah, hi. This is Steven. We had a 5 p.m. meeting to look at the mattress. Where are you at, bud? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm 30 minutes away. I'll be there soon. Now, as you know, I hate being late. I also hate when others are late. Seriously? It's 5.35 p.m. and we agreed at 5 p.m., Brian. Don't bother. We're leaving. I told you to call me when you were leaving so that I knew you were coming. This is the first time you're calling me, so now I'm coming. What? Look, Brian. I called you when we left our house and I left a voicemail. I texted you to let you know we were on the highway. We agreed to 5 p.m. and you stood us up. I dragged my daughter and wife out here for no reason and now I have to fight traffic to get back home. Thank you for wasting our time. I hung up before he could get another word in. I was furious. Who sets a time to meet but then doesn't show up until the person calls? Clearly this guy wasn't a real businessman. He called me right back, but I ignored it. We needed dinner and showers. We had routines to follow or this baby was going to be up all night. He texted me right after trying to justify his reasoning, telling me I was foolish for not wanting to wait around to save so much money on a $1,000 mattress. Obviously this guy didn't have kids. I added his number to my spam list so that I wouldn't get any more calls or texts from him and apologized to my wife for wasting our evening. I work two jobs to make enough for our bills and we don't have much time together as a family. I feel like a bit of a failure, but my wife always reassures me, thanking me for working so hard. Still, I can't shake the sadness I feel when I come home late and barely get to spend any time with them. So I was extra frustrated when Brian was wasting one of my free evenings. Of course, traffic was awful heading back out of downtown, and there were two accidents. Because why not add insult to injury? My daughter was starting to get fussy, so I was singing all of her favorite songs and making silly faces to keep her occupied. It took over an hour to get home, but once we hit the driveway, everything was forgotten and we all smiled. Home at last. We went through our normal routine of dinner and bath time, and instead of turning on the television, I just played with my daughter until she was ready for bed. It was a nice change of pace. I can't believe how big she is getting. The alarm went off far too early for my liking, but I got up and did my best to crawl out of the dip in the bed without arousing anyone else. Got dressed, packed my lunch, ate a quick breakfast, and I was off to work. The day was pretty uneventful, which was nice because I couldn't keep my eyes open easily. Normally, I get a few calls from my wife during the day and at least one picture showing our daughter doing something silly or new, but I didn't get any on that day. I knew they had a few plans to go to the petting zoo and story time at the library, so I didn't think too much of it, although I did miss my daily picture. Wednesday is always a special day because it is food pantry day. At first we were just embarrassed, but we try to make the best of it by guessing what dessert they give us. The generosity of people in our area is so amazing. They donate all organic foods, even organic meat. I usually make it home before my wife is done at the pantry, so I tidy up the house and get ready to go out and grab all the bags full of food. I kicked off my work boots and put my lunch bag away, cleaning up a few dishes in the sink and washing down my daughter's high chair tray. As I headed into the bedroom to change into some comfortable clothes, I stopped dead in my tracks. There, in place of our small lumpy bed, was the king-sized mattress on a simple bed frame. It even had sheets on it nice ones. A few tears gathered at my eye because I realized why my wife never called me today. She was busy surprising me with the new bed. She must have found Brian's ad on Craigslist and went up to meet him on her own while I was at work. What a wonderful woman she is. On the bed was a small white card. I rushed over to it, flopping onto the bed and taking the card in my hand to read. Dear Stephen, I hope you like the mattress. Don't worry about payment. I already took what I needed. Brian. What the hell? I sprang up off the bed and went to my phone, calling my wife. No answer. No problem. She's probably wrapping up food at the pantry or driving home. 
She never answers when she's driving. I waited 15 more minutes before calling again. She is never this late from coming home. 4.15 at the latest, and it was already 4.30. I called again, straight to voicemail. Tried not to let my imagination run wild, but I couldn't help it. Was she in an accident? Is she stuck in traffic? Please answer. After 20 minutes and no response from her, I drove over to the food pantry and found the managing volunteer just before they closed up for the night. Hey, Terry, was my wife here today? Oh, hi, Stephen. No, she never came today. I was a bit surprised myself, but I thought maybe you finally found a better job and didn't need to come anymore. I drove home faster than the law or safety would dictate, praying that her car would be in the driveway. But it wasn't. I tried calling one more time. No luck. Sprinting around my house, I searched for anything strange or missing. That's when I noticed the picture frame on our nightstand. The picture was torn down one side, leaving just me. Tears started flowing down my face, coating my phone as I dialed 911. Just a quick update slash answer of various questions from the comments. First, thank you all for your concern. The local police and I are doing everything we can to try and locate my family. I will let you know as soon as I hear anything positive or negative regarding the case. Secondly, I understand that Craigslist can be shady. I have dealt many times with buying and selling without ever having an issue for many years. Please understand I'm in a difficult financial position right now, which is why I even looked around for a mattress on Craigslist. We go to a food pantry every week, so yes, times are tough. I can only do what I can do. So far we are unsure of how Brian found our home or got in. There was no sign of a forced entry and no record of anyone calling or texting my wife or her calling or texting anyone over the course of the day outside the actual content saved to her phone. She received no emails either. Our neighbors did notice a moving truck or something similar come by during the day. Still no idea about that either. Update 2. The police have put out my wife and daughter's picture to try and get the word out. I went up to the storage facility to try and talk to the receptionist but it was a new woman today. She looked up storage units owned by Brian, and there was not a single unit. Can you believe that? Over 1,400 units and not a single Brian. I mean, it's a common name. I feel like something is getting covered up, so I'm coming back later to snoop around on my own. I also unblocked the number and tried to call, but all I get is a disconnected number message. The police are trying to track it to a house or business, but they aren't telling me much, which worries me more than anything else. Oh, and since many of you have mentioned my family being in the mattress, the police took the mattress as evidence. They checked it inside and out for clues. They are not inside. For those asking for some proof, since the police took most of it, I only had a chance to snap a picture of the note and torn picture. Number three, last year when I was moving from my apartment to my house, I dropped my box with my laptop and it was damaged beyond repair. I definitely didn't have the money for a new one, so I went on Craigslist to find a cheap deal. After hours of searching for one that was decent and affordable, I found a Windows 10 for only 25 bucks. I was astonished and emailed the owner right away in hopes it hadn't been bought at such a good deal. I was in good luck because they miraculously hadn't sold it yet. I was ecstatic. And when I went to pick it up, I asked the man why he was selling it for so cheap and he said his sister had recently passed away and they were cleaning out her house, so they were selling different things from her house. It didn't creep me out too much that I was using a dead person's computer, but it felt weird that they were giving up her belongings so quickly. I brought the computer home and was so excited to use it. I plugged it in right away and it started loading after a minute. It was crazy. The computer was in perfect condition, not even a scratch and it was loading surprisingly fast. When it started up, the background popped up, and it was a pitch black screen with three letters in white that read EMX. I didn't know what it meant, but I suppose she had worked for an obscure company. I wondered if she had cleared her files off the computer, and being the nosy person that I was, checked the On This PC tab for files. I didn't find anything at all until I checked the Documents tab. There were just three items there. The first item read, Case 322 Experiment. 
I clicked the first item open and out came a summary of their little experiment of case 322. Case number 322. Notes, case suffers severe schizophrenia and depression and experienced frequent hallucinations and paralysis. We will be experimenting with treatments for her unique and unusual case. It should be noted that the case is extremely violent, has been speculated at most violent of all cases, constant murder slash torture threats, surprising detail and graphic descriptions for someone at such a young age as her. That was the end of that item. I was horrified at the fact that it appeared they had given me a computer formerly used for children's neurological experiments. Being the curious person I was though, I decided to keep reading on. Biggest mistake of my life. The second item read, Safety slash concern. Forewarn, I opened the item and it appeared to be a list, safety concerns of case 322. It should be noted that those chosen for experimentation on case 322 shall be at utmost high standard and serious precautions must be taken. Case 322 has been involved in the following acts. Number one, the murder of her entire family. Two, the murder of four civilians during an escape from her home. Three, two bank robberies. Four, over 200 death threats towards figures of authority, police, guards, doctors, therapists, teachers, school staff, and others. 5. Writing a death note to a classmate. 6. Pulling out her own hair from her roots and eating it. 7. Pulling her teeth out and stabbing herself in the eye with it. 8. Over 20 suicide attempts, including hanging, overdose of drugs, self-inflicting shots with a firearm, jumping off the table of a building, and stabbing herself. 9. Attacking a police officer and nearly killing them. As expected, this is not a full list of offenses, but are the most prominent. When conducting experiments, do not leave case unattended and do not take eyes off of her. Keep keys to experimentation room out of her parameters and make sure she is restrained in straitjacket through the whole process. Have guards on duty at all times of experimentation. And that was the end of that file. I then understood they weren't dealing with a normal messed up kid. They were dealing with a serial killer, a psychopath. I was sick to my stomach at this point. Why did this woman have such a private matter on an at-home computer? How did her family not know about this? Why was she dead? The third file read, Experiment Documentation Day 1, Case 322 fought and screamed until sedated. She is surprisingly strong for her stature and for being only age 14. Experiments went well, not much progress. Day 2, Case 322 stabbed a guard in the eye with a bobby pin. Cases no longer allowed hair utilities. Cases to have head shaved to prevent it being used as a noose or strangle slash choking slash suffocator weapon. After proper sedation, we found a serious neurological phenomenon in her brain, most likely the cause of her issues. Day 3. Case 322 woke up from sedation during experiments and played asleep as she slowly attempted to escape from restraint. Patients sprung up in middle of experiment, tackled the doctor and broke their hip bone before being restrained by guards doctor to receive compensation. Sedation will be amped up several milligrams and restraining methods are to be more advanced. Day 4, two guards and a nurse were killed in an escape. Building was put on lockdown. Case was found hiding in a cleaning closet. Day 5, experiments are becoming increasingly more dangerous for the team. We are debating the end of experiments for safety reasons. Case 322 is by far the most severely and please excuse my improper tone, messed up and psychotic case ever speculated by our team. Day 6. Case 322 is no longer allowed fingernails. Day 7. I know I'm about to die, but if I'm going to die, I am going to make sure these last few things are documented. She killed the rest of the team. I am hiding in my locked office, but she is close. I can hear her footsteps. We never figured out how to treat this phenomenon. This is rarely ever, possibly never said in this field, but this case is absolutely helpless. There is no cure. She is a lost cause. She's picking the lock right now. If my family ever finds this, I love you guys. And case 322 is out there somewhere. She's in. Goodbye, cruel world. And then just gibberish. This is case 322. Well, that's what they call me. I killed this piece of trash. Bleach blonde waste of life. She's dead. If her family is reading this, I enjoyed banging her head against the desk until she died. I love watching the life drain from my victims. And good luck ever finding me. I'm dropping her laptop off at her house so they can't use it for evidence. I know where she lives, and I'll find you too. And it ended. 
I shut off the computer and went straight back to the man's house. I asked him how his sister died. He seemed taken aback by the question, but answered saying she was murdered. I gave him the computer and showed him the files. We turned it into the police station and there has been an ongoing search ever since. Everyone in the area is told to keep doors locked at all times. Keep on the lookout for the girl. She is out there, somewhere. They still haven't found her. I still have no clue what EMX is. The only thing that really still keeps me paranoid is the ending. And I'll find you too. Honestly, based off the description of how crazy she is, I can't tell you I don't believe her. I live in a four bedroom apartment downtown. After graduating college, myself and a couple bros from Omega Pi Epsilon went half seas on a cheap place. There's me, David, although everyone calls me Trip because I have a third nipple. Okay, not really, but I have a mole near my left nipple that the guys call my Trip Nip. There's Chad, who we call Captain Ahab because the dude is obsessed with bigger girls. Preston, or Little League, got his name because my man sleeps with a baseball bat in his sheets with him. Says it's for home security, but all he's ever done with it is get super drunk and hit beer cans off the roof. Lastly, there's Duke, who is known as Squirts. Unfortunately for you, the history of that name is classified Omega Pi Epsilon knowledge. We just graduated pretty recently, and none of us really have savings or jobs that make that much money. Little League's dad had been bankrolling him for a while, but he refuses to chip in any extra on the bills we split, so the budget is extremely tight. That being said, we've managed to turn our little shithole of an apartment into a nice-ish bachelor pad. Captain Ahab's brother worked at a bar that closed, so he hooked us up with several choice neon bar signs. I had a pong table that I bought from Spencer's a few years back. It doesn't light up anymore, but it still has a pretty cool neon design. We have a few beanbag chairs we got from the rec room at school when they changed out the furniture. The only thing we didn't have was a couch. That's why I turned to Craigslist. I know, getting a couch off Craigslist is a little shady, but we're balling on a budget. I found a few couches for sale, but they were all ugly old lady couches. When I switched over to the free page, though, I found something perfect. A blue suede couch for free, only half an hour away. I called the number listed and confirmed that it was still available. The man I talked to was super chill, even offered to bring it to our place since he was planning on taking it to the dump anyway. About an hour later, this big pickup pulled up. I could see the blue of the couch poking out under the tarp. The guy I spoke to on the phone introduced himself as Bill and helped me unload it into our living room. Nice guy. I gave him a natty light for the road. We've had the couch in the living room for a few weeks now. It's pretty comfy, and the blue kind of matches the blue tint of the biggest beer sign, which is pretty sick. I was sure that the next time I brought a chick home, she would totally dig the atmosphere. The only problem is that our living room has this funny smell to it. After investigating, I realized the offensive odor was coming from the couch. At first, I thought maybe it was just the smell of the previous owner's house, but it seemed to be getting stronger. It's been cold outside, though, so I've been cranking up the heat. I brushed it off as the various smells of four bachelors sitting on it with their sweaty balls. I'm pretty sure Captain Ahab screwed a big girl who's been hanging around on it too, so that probably didn't help. I've been Febrezing it as much as possible, hoping that it would cover up the stink. And it does for a few hours, but then the smell comes back, stronger than before. A few nights ago we had a party, tons of people, not as many chicks as I had originally hoped, but there were a few hotties and a few sixties who could quickly turn into eights after several drinks. I picked one who seemed mildly interested and partnered up with her for Pong. Bad call. She couldn't chug. Kept gagging. So the other team kept scoring on us, and I got wasted after a few rounds. Although the Jaeger bombs in the kitchen afterwards probably didn't help much either. I don't know if I scored with... Amanda? Ashley? It started with an A. Or an E. Aaron? Whatever. I'm inclined to believe that I did not, however, because I woke up face down on the beanbag chair. When I opened my eyes, hung over as shit, I rolled over to see Captain Ahab sprawled out on the couch, leg over and back. It looked like even if I didn't get lucky, Captain did. There was a huge dip in the couch. I decided to grab a shower. I stumbled into the bathroom and peeled off my Omega Pi Epsilon Get It On Flip Cup Championship 2015 t-shirt, shorts, and boxers before jumping in and turning on the water. I was the first one up, so the water was still hot. It was nice, really nice. So nice that I spent longer than necessary in there thinking about 
Aaron. Emma? Eh, whatever. That I, maybe, hooked up with. When I got out, I grabbed a towel and dried off my hair before toweling my arms and legs and wrapping it around my waist. I brushed my teeth and gargled, spitting out the water. I checked the mirror to see if I looked hungover. I did. I grabbed a leftover drink from last night. Think it was mine. It was in the pimp chalice and took a big chug. Don't judge. A little hair off the dog never hurts. Then I headed out to the living room where Captain was sitting up groggily. Hey, big fella, I said softly. Shut the fuck up, Trip. He moaned, holding his head. You, dude, what the fuck is that? I asked, pointing at his arm. It was covered in splotchy red marks. What? He muttered, holding his arm out to look. I noticed it on his face as well. Fuck, man, I don't know. He grumbled before standing up. Shower free? Yeah, go wash that stank off you. I laughed before downing the rest of my drink. I figured that there must have been some detergent or something on the couch that caused the rashes, so I went over to see what I could do. It looked like someone had spilled a drink or two on the cushions. Either that or Captain Ahab pissed himself. Lifting up the cushions to see if the covers came off for washing, I realized that they were heavy as hell, soaking wet. I wondered what happened the night before. Maybe we got a little crazier than I realized. As I tossed the cushions on the ground, the smell was overwhelming, worse than it had ever been. I looked underneath the cushions at the back of the couch and was overwhelmed with nausea, crawling underneath the cushion near the crack of the couch were a couple dozen maggots, wiggling and squirming across the fabric. Overcome with disgust and stomach filled with beer, Red Bull, and Jaeger, I went to the bathroom and vomited, pro-fucking-fusely. Nastiest shit I think I've ever seen. I shouted at Captain through the shower curtain, downed a bottle of Gatorade, gotta keep those electrolytes, son, and threw a t-shirt over my nose. I put the cushions back on the couch and propped open the front door. Captain threw on clothes and met me in the living room. Together we loved the stinkiness out of the apartment and to the dumpster. About halfway there we heard a thud, and the couch got a lot lighter. Looking down at the ground, we saw what was stinking. Laying on the parking lot pavement, sprawled almost at my feet, was a goddamn human body. We threw the couch down and booked it back inside. I've called the police, and they haven't managed to identify the body, nor what it died from. But they didn't say that it looked like murder, more like natural causes. The post on Craigslist has been removed, and I passed along a description of the guy who brought over the couch and his phone number to the cops, although they said it appears to be disconnected. After the police left, Captain threw up and said he needed to go lay down. I'm kinda worried about the guy, because he's barely left his room the last few days, and the rashes seem to have gotten worse, blistering even. He doesn't have health coverage either, since his dad lost his job last month, and Little League refuses to help pay for him to go to the hospital. Anybody know what he could have? Before we get to number one, if you've ever been curious as to what I look like in real life, then follow me on Instagram at DylanIsChillinYT with underscores instead of spaces. I also have a Twitter at YT underscore chills where I post video updates. I'd really appreciate it if you followed me and feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions. If you'd like to see more of these videos in the future, then hit that subscribe button because I upload a new scary video every Thursday. Number one. When my friend told me he hooked up with a random girl from Craigslist, I thought he was insane, but I'm sure most geniuses sound crazy. Even after he attributed his great night to luck, I still felt inclined to try it. After a couple days of browsing and a couple drinks too many, I posted my first ad. I gave out the details and some flexibility just to ensure I get something tonight. I started cleaning up and I checked the time. Hey man, I posted my ad. Just to be safe, what should I do? I don't want to give out my address and shit to some serial killer or something, lol. Fuck, I hate cleaning. I straighten up some more until I hear my phone vibrate. Definitely call her so you can make sure it's a girl, and you might be able to tell if she's hot, lmao. Let me know when she's on her way or whatever. I'll call you to make sure everything is okay, cool? Enjoy, bro. Before replying, I decided to check my email to see if anyone replied. The spam is easy to weed out thanks to me asking for a specific subject. After four emails of can you send pics in a number, I finally got the email I've been waiting for. Pretty woman in her mid-thirties cheating on her neglectful husband. Potential sob story. But I'm not the one to mediate things like this. I called and we talked for a few so things weren't as awkward when she got here. She's on her way, I'll see you tomorrow, winky face. 
I hurried to the kitchen and made some drinks and added some final spruces to my place. After 30 minutes of terrible anticipation and increasing horniness, my phone vibrated. I'm outside, what door were you? Opting for safety, I decided to meet her outside and lead her in. I did a quick double check in the mirror before heading out, but when I did, it made it all worth it. Who knew beautiful women like this look for anonymous sex on the internet? All negative thoughts left my mind when I grabbed her hand, and they were quickly replaced with dirtier and dirtier ones once I led her into my apartment. I made some drinks while she sat on the couch. We made some idle conversation, mainly about how often we do this and blah blah. Surprisingly, this isn't my first time doing this, she told me almost breaking down. Instead of crying more, I just advanced the combo and asked her what she likes to do. I managed to slip in that it was my first time doing this. She kissed me and asked me for directions to the bedroom. I got up and reached for her hand. When I turned around, I noticed she was looking in her purse. I guess she didn't notice me because she was looking for a while but she smiled reassuringly when I told her that I already had condoms. We laid in bed and took each other's clothes off, but she suddenly got up and went to the bathroom. Could you get me another drink, please? She called out from the bathroom. Same thing you were drinking? I walked out and laughed at the craziness of the situation. I don't know what compelled me to look through her purse, but I'm glad I did. I walked back into the room right as she came out, looking worried and asked if I could call her cell phone. Of course, I happily obliged, and while she looked for that, she asked me if I could grab her purse from the front room because she had a surprise for me. Hey, is this you calling me? This isn't the same number you gave me, she laughed. Oh yeah, my friend told me to do that for Craigslist until we meet. I said as I grabbed her purse. Really, why? He says it's because you really, really shouldn't trust people you meet on Craigslist. I replied as I locked the door. Thanks for checking out this video. Be sure to subscribe because I upload a new scary video every Thursday. Or, if you're still not convinced, here are some of our other videos that I think you'd like. Enjoy!